Hi friends, this is Joe. This is the Decahedron RPG podcast. I was away last week. Sorry about that. I'll talk more about that at the end of the show. Today I'm talking about finding your D&D character's motivation. I say D&D, it could be any RPG. This is something personally I never have a problem with, but I heard from a friend who heard it from a friend who heard it from a... No, I'm not going to sing REO Speedwagon. <laughs> um, anyway, um, that this is something that they struggle with. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we use some like real life psychology to come up with your D and D characters motivations. Now, for those that don't know, I was in the air force for like a billion years <laughs> and back in the 1980s and nineties, before a lot of you were born, I bet <laughs> um, back then, all the Air Force leadership courses all talked about this thing called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And this is talking about what people need from a psychological point of view. Maslow was a you know psychoanalyst type dude way back when, and he came up with this, this thing. Uh, as with anything, actually anything I could present in a short little podcast slash YouTube video, it's very simplified. But for a role-playing game, that's all you need. But I'm using it for gaming here. Don't use this as life advice. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the guy for that. So Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs is pretty much... Um, what you don't need, no, let me try that. What you need the most in your life is going to motivate your actions to go out and fill that need. But when you have competing needs, there is a hierarchy <laughs> um, that takes place. And you go to take care of the, the lower needs first. Um, and only once those are meet can you start working on fulfilling those, those higher needs. So, for example, at the very bottom of the, the hierarchy is your physiological needs. You know, food, water, air. Um, <laughs> and a good way to look, think about it is if you're, if you're drowning underwater, you don't really care about your love life at that moment. <laughs> Well, unless, of course, it's your partner holding you under the water, in which case you might be thinking, where did I go wrong? But anyway, <laughs> what you care about <laughs> is getting out of the water so you can breathe, so you can live. You know, it's that animal part of the brain that kicks in. And until that need is fixed, you're not worried about anything else. I mean, we're there. So, so let's go through the, the whole thing. For some reason, it's usually drawn as a pyramid. Uh, Maslow never drew it as a pyramid. It's just something that happened. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the pyramid right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that bottom level, uh, physiological, is what I just said. Air, food, water, right? If you're not getting those needs met, your focus is going to be on meeting those needs. And of course, you know, air might not work well for a D&D &D character. Uh, could be a short-lived campaign. Uh, but when you're making your character... But the others, like food and water, uh, this could indicate someone who's grown up uh, destitute and poor. And that's, you know, that is their driving factor. They are going adventuring, not so they can seek some thrills or anything, but so that they can survive or so that they can feed their family and they can survive. Uh, it's that basic human need. Um, yeah, so it's a very primal motivation and it would work. Um, I should also point out that what you think you need isn't necessarily, doesn't match what you really need. Um, for example, let's say a claustrophobic who's in a closet, right? They think they need air. They think they're going to die. They think they're suffocating, but they're not. Um, <laughs> So I'm just saying, when you determine which one of these needs we're going to do as your character's motivations, um, don't 
necessarily think that that is that is what they really need. It's it's what they think they need. It's what's motivating them, what's driving them. So, for example, if you have this you know basic level, um, maybe they grew up that way and they needed food growing up. They grew up hungry, but now they're well to do and they're they're okay. But they still seek out that food because in the back of the brain they need that. And so maybe they're they're an overeater. Um, that can make an interesting character. Next is safety. No, so once your your needs are met, once you can, you know, I have this, I have a good supply of air, I have a good supply of food, uh, I can pay my bills, whatever. Um, you need to feel safe. You know, if you live in a place where you are constantly in danger of um, being attacked by maybe wild animals or maybe by bad people, uh, your your driving motivation is to be get out of that place to get a place where you can feel safe to be uh, to be safe. I mean, there's no other way to put it, right? To be secure, so you're not under that constant threat. The next level is belonging and love. Um, this is what I was joking about before when I said if your partner's holding you underwater. Um, but you know, if you feel safe, if your basic needs are all being met, that's when you start to feel, I need to be loved. I need someone in my life, or someone's maybe. And that becomes your motivation, you know. Really, I don't need to say anything more about that. Above that is esteem, self-esteem and uh, the esteem of others. I need to feel good about myself. I need others to feel good about me. I need them to hold me in high regard. I think bards are stuck kind of at this level and they're looking for that esteem. They're looking for uh, people to say, yes, he, he's great. What a great guy that bard is. Um, and that's why they perform and that's why they make YouTube videos? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, the next level up is cognitive. So, you know, your basic needs are met, you feel safe, you, um, you feel loved, you feel respected, you respect yourself. Now you can start thinking about just like expanding your mind, right? I, knowing for the sake of uh, learning, for the sake of learning type stuff. Um, this, this makes me think of wizards, right? Your classic D&D wizard, you know, you're, you're seeking knowledge. Uh, also, Call of Cthulhu, a lot of that in there. But anyway, after that is the aesthetic level. This is, all right, all my basic needs are met. I've got people in my life. I'm respected. I, I, I know things. Now I want to be surrounded by beauty. Beauty for the sake of beauty. This is um, why when people can, they often move to beautiful places, mountains or beaches. They put artwork in their house, like a clockwork clock, maybe? I don't know. Maslow, or at least, said that this isn't just like something we want because it's so universal and we all seek after it. This, this is a need. This is something we need, but we don't need it as much as we need food. Yeah, so if this is your need. Maybe you're an art collector, or maybe you just like going to rare and beautiful places and seek them out. That's why you adventure. The next step is self actualization. This is your classic monk in D and D. This is all my needs are met. I'm going to focus on being the best me I can be. It's being the best for the sake of being the best. That's it. Like I said, it, it reminds me of the classic monk. Uh, Paladin may? No, 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 no. I think the Paladin is going to be on the next level. Uh, yeah. I'm going to stick with monk. Although I could see a, a fighter doing this. Actually, any of these could be applied to any, right? Because um, a wizard could just be, you know, I'm going to be the best darn wizard I can be. and uh, The best of the world, you know. You're, you're, it's your need to be the best. The final level is transcendence. Um, that's what Maslow called it. This is, so on self-actualization, you were worried about being the best you you could be. Now you're worried about 
all those around you, making them the best that they can be. Uh, your focus of concern is no longer on yourself, it's on others. This would be your cleric, this would be your paladin. But again, any of these could be any. All right, that's the hierarchy of needs. How do you use this to motivate your character? Well, I think I gave enough of that, right? If this is your need, or if at least your character perceives this as their need, um, play them in such a way that they go out to fulfill these needs. That's that simple. But how do you determine which one of these? Well, I already said, according to class, you could say it's one of those. That's a way. But more interestingly, because then you fall into all these cliche characters, right? Your cliche monk, your cliche paladin, all that stuff. So a more interesting way is roll them randomly. And because in life, so very few people are at the transcendent stage and so few people are in that physiological stage, because if they are, they tend not to live very long. Um, people are in the middle. So the way I would do this is I would roll 3d8 and take the middle value. So if you roll a 6, 7, 8, it's a 7. <laughs> if you roll a 1, 4, 4, it's 4, right? Take away the high die and the low die. Whatever one is left, that's the value. If you roll 1, 1, 1, it's 1. So, of course, one would be physiological, two would be safety, um, three would be belonging and love, four would be esteem, five would be cognitive, six would be aesthetic, seven would be uh, self-actualization, and eight would be uh, transcendence. So, yeah, just roll those three D8, get rid of the high and the low, take the middle. That should weight the die roll towards the middle tier there. Uh, see whatever it says, and then... Think about what that means to your character. Say, okay, this is my motivation. My motive, look, I should have rolled some dice. <laughs> so let's just make up some numbers. Four, four, five. So four, four is esteem, right? So uh, maybe the character doesn't feel very good about themselves or maybe they are feel okay themselves, but they don't feel respected in the community. Oh, now that's good. I like that, right? So, um, my goal, my motivation is to be respected in the community. So I am going to open doors for old ladies. I'm going to help cats cross the street, whatever. Play your character that way. When you go adventuring, the reason you're adventuring is so you can come back and people will tell stories about your bravery and your daring and you'll have uh, money or other signs of esteem. So that's it. That is my thought of using Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs to help you find your character's motivation. Let me know what you think. Comments below if you're on YouTube. Feedback at Decahedron if you're other places or you just feel like sending an email. Uh, you can record a voice file. You can put it there. Or you can call my feedback line, <laughs> which is 562-774-2278. That's 562-RPG-CAST. Or you can go to say hi.chat slash decahedron, and there is a, uh, a thing there where you can leave a voice message. All those on the show notes, they're in the, uh, the yeah, they're in the show notes. <laughs> they're in the description below if you're on YouTube. So that's all for this week. Until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye. Ah, you're still here, huh? <laughs> all right. So I want to do all the business part up front. I'm just going to be a little social, um, or I'm going to tell you what, why I missed a week. So James and I sat down and we recorded, and uh, I had technical issues. <laughs> we did a review for uh, Star Trek Adventure Gaming in the Final Frontier, and there were technical issues, and we went through the whole thing. It was great, but when I went to play it back, um, my audio was stuttering and gaps missing and everything. It was the equipment I was using. Um, that's what you get for trying to save a couple bucks. So I was like, okay, I will just record a quick episode and I'll throw it out. But Valerie and I had decided to go down to Pennsylvania um, for the long weekend. And... I chose her over you, and I'm not even going to apologize for that because she's my wife, and she comes first. 
Uh, but yeah, so we went down to Pennsylvania. Uh, every few years I like to go down, I like to watch the elk in rutting season. I love it when the, the male elk lock their antlers. Uh, it's awesome. Didn't see any any males in combat. In fact, it wasn't a very good weekend for elk viewing. All of Saturday, we were pretty much rained out. And on Sunday, it wasn't until the end of the day until we finally saw some. Normally, we have much better luck. But on Sunday, I looked on the map and I'm like, we're only 20 miles from Poxitawney. <laughs> so we went down to Poxitawney, Pennsylvania, where they do the Groundhog Day every year. And it's really cool because they don't even like keep the stuff locked up. They let you walk up on the stage and you can be where they do their little announcement every year. And then if you go downtown, there's the place where they actually keep Poxitawney Phil. By the way, he's 120 years old and Groundhogs normally only live to seven. So they brew magic up there. <laughs> um, and the, the town is where they actually keep Phil and his family. Sadly, though, we were there on Sunday, and it's closed on Sundays. And I was like, oh, we're not going to be able to see Phil. But as we were walking around, um, there's all these statues of groundhogs throughout the town. Kind of like in Rhode Island, they had a thing one year where they had statues of Mr. Potato Head because he was born in Rhode Island. You know, I always talk about that paradise that is Rhode Island. That's the home of Hasbro, which owns D&D. So, hey, whatever. <laughs> Actually, they own Wizards, which owns D&D anyway. Oh, and uh, here in, in Rochester, New York, there was this thing with statues of horses for some reason. I don't know what horses have to do with Rochester. Over in uh, Buffalo, they have statues of Buffalo. Um, but in Pakistani, it's groundhogs, and they're adorable. And the one outside of Wendy's in particular was very cute. And uh, we enjoyed that. But as we were walking around looking at the statues, we were in front of the building where they keep Phil, but they keep him in the window. They have this whole little diorama for him and this little stuff for him and his family. So, and we actually got to saw, we got to saw, we got to see Phil. Uh, so that's what I was doing instead of making episodes. So apologies, question mark? I don't know. It was fun. Um, I, I love the podcast. I, uh, I'm good at not missing episodes, but eh, I took a break. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching to this extended comment uh, content, and I will see you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Dekahedron RPG podcast. Please come back again to the Dekahedron. Oh